I too uh, thank the um, mover of the petition for the way in which she introduced it. It was very difficult. I think it was obvious to, to most who saw that uh, not maybe everything in the petition was something which the member agreed with, and that does place a, a person in a difficult circumstance when they're introducing a petition in this place. But I thank her nonetheless for the gracious way in which it was introduced. This debate, uh, Sir Charles, is uh, about the right to abortion being uniquely enshrined in law in the United Kingdom via a Bill of Rights. So uniquely that something that is allowed to destroy, not protect, should be brought onto the Bill of Rights. I think we need to see that in the light of it because normally we bring in laws that are on a positive framework, on a declaratively positive framework. This is about something which is actually on a negative framework. And I say that with all true compassion because, like those in the House, no one wants to see a situation where a woman feels she has to have or is in a situation where abortion is her only way out. But to have something enshrined in a Bill of Rights and to frame it in that new constitutional dispensation, I think would be totally abhorrent to how law should be made in the United Kingdom. Many of my constituents who have spoken to me about this in advance of, of this debate are, are fundament, see this as fundamentally wrong, and indeed many have expressed that it's a fundamentally evil way in which to create law over this issue of life, because it is such a fraught matter. And I think that it is important that that point of view is listened to. Many have talked about the international legal position. Of course, the European Convention of Human Rights, which at best will probably be the main template from which a UK Bill of Rights, if it is ever drawn up, will probably be based upon. Of course, the European Convention of Human Rights does not enshrine the right to an abortion or the right to give an abortion. It doesn't touch on that matter at all for the very obvious reasons I think that I've already stated that it is not their place to do it. This is a matter of domestic law, and indeed the rights that many people on the different side of the argument are seeking to protect, I would go so far to say that those rights are stronger under our British constitutional system of domestic law rather than having a rights-based type of law on this particular matter. This debate has also been shrouded from time to time not in this chamber, I might add, but outside of this chamber and arriving to this petition has been shrouded in misinformation. We saw the whole social media um, issues around it. In fact, TikTok had to take down some of the comments that were being made. So people, I think, were falsely driven to sign a petition on the basis of misinformation. Now, of course, I I still think this debate would have come about. I still think it would have been uh, something which we should not run away from. It's important that we have this debate. I agree with members for all different sorts of reasons. That's important that this debate does take place. But it it should not be brought about to this House because of misinformation or by a social media campaign or a vanity project by someone who wants to have some sort of clutch to to a, a, a moment of fame on this particular matter. That's not the reason why we should be doing this. We, uh, I will know, we should be doing this for the right reasons. And of course, I will give way. And of, of the intent that the petitioner had, who was actually sitting behind you if you want to chat with her after. Um, sorry. Uh, I genuinely think that when we had the debate on assisted dying in this place, there were accusations against uh, groups and organisations. That is not what the Petitions Committee is about. It is not misinformation. It is where you choose to get your information from. And the fact that we are here shows that the Petitions Committee is working and that a person's voice can be heard in Parliament. I thank thank the member. I think maybe she she, she misheard me because uh, um, I was not challenging the right to have the debate. I was challenging the misinformation that had been in social media that had encouraged people to falsely sign it. Uh, If the debate is is so positive, therefore there should be no negativity behind encouraging people to actually sign it. And the word ethos 
It's very, very interesting. It's Greek origins show that it should actually be about an ethic. It should actually be about something which has character to it and not something which is uh, denuded of character and of strength in, in that particular way. So I think the member perhaps misheard uh, what I was uh, getting at and the point that I was making. Uh, it does lay bare the falsehood, and indeed I will say again the naivety of bringing to this House a debate, um, indeed how wrong it is to bring to this House a debate, or to try to shape our laws by the experiences of the American legal constitutional system. It, it, the, the two cannot, if you juxtapose them, it just does not work. We have a parliamentary democracy and statute law uh, versus a, a written constitution in the United States of America uh, and, and all of the, the, the different issues that flow from that. And then to juxtapose and set upon that another layer of, oh, this is about fear because of what happened with Roe and Wade, a completely separate issue again. I think it is naive to say that we should then try and change our whole system to embrace and to address this issue um, uh, because of what has happened in the United States of America. It would be far better having a much more open and honest debate rather than one that is based upon fear of something which might happen. Of course, I will give way. Thank you, Honourable Gentleman, for giving He's making a really important, about, important point about uh, not having misinformation. And would he agree with me that we have to be very careful in this debate not to conflate deregulation with decriminalisation? which I think is what's happened in a couple of the earlier um, uh, uh, contributions. He will know from Northern Ireland that whilst we've introduced decriminalisation, that has not deregulated the controls that are there for abortion. And that's a really, really important yeah, point. Th th thank you, Sir Charles. And, and that is an important point. I will come to it later on, uh, whenever I touch on the matter of uh, decriminalisation. There were 214,000. 869 abortions in England and Wales in 2021. I, I looked that up. That's about 40,000 people short of the population of Wolfenstone. Just, just think of the number. If you were to line them up, the vast array. You know what that says to me, Sir Charles? The utter abysmal failure of abortion regulations in the United Kingdom. Uh, the utter abysmal failure of abortion regulations. Why so many? Why after years, decades and decades and decades of this regulation, why is that so necessary? 214,869 women felt it was necessary to have an abortion. I will of course go away. I sympathise with, with the honourable gentleman, but he is not really going to carry the House with an argument that says that the number of abortions is equivalent to the human population of a city, when a vast proportion of those abortions will be at a very early stage of barely fertilized eggs. And although I see people on the other side nodding in agreement with me, Equally to them, I would say, the demand for an absolute right of abortion similarly in reverse fails to recognize that a very late-term abortion is killing an embryo which is viable. And that's why this is a dialogue of the deaf. Well, well I, I'm sorry the Honourable Gentleman feels it is a, a dialogue of the deaf. I, I, don't, I don't think that is the case. I think it's important that we actually, for the first time in a long time, are actually having a sensible debate in this matter, because in, in numerous debates in this House in the past on abortion, people have been silenced. Principally, male members of the House have been silenced. Uh, and, and what has been said, they've been called out, they've been uh, heckled, they've been told not, not, not to speak in issues, it doesn't concern them. Indeed, but the comments earlier in this debate today that um, abortion, um, uh, that, that behind every abortion is a woman, full stop. No, 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 no. Behind every abortion, behind every pregnancy, it's not only a woman, it's the life of the unborn and the male who was involved in that pregnancy. And until we have, until we have a full engagement and educational process that addresses those issues and gets this nation to speak about that, not in a climate of fear, why well, better not speak out, we're not allowed to say these things anymore, they're too difficult to say if you're a man. Unless we get into a proper debate in this matter, as, as we should, then I'm afraid this will be 
a debate of the day of. But it doesn't have to be. I think that's a point, of course, I will give way. Uh, Rob Brown for giving way. He's making a very powerful speech. Men do matter. You're absolutely right. Uh, Eighty-two percent of all abortions last year were uh, for women whose marital status was given as single. I actually commend those men who support their partner and their child, and we need more men to do the same. And this house is at risk of silencing those men who do actually stand up and take responsibility within pregnancy. I thank the member for, for her point. In 2022, there was double the provision um, of abortions in Northern Ireland than the year previous. And that was a number which doubled each year and will continue to double in Northern Ireland because of now the very liberal uh, legislation that is now in place in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think another member put on the record that one in four of all pregnancies and uh, an abortion in the United Kingdom. In, in England and Wales, the right to abort up is up to the very extreme limit of six months. You know, six months into pregnancy, yes, I, I still wish to have an abortion, whereas the European medium time limit is three months. And I think we do need to have a debate around those issues as to why we have an extreme time limit and why there's some people who wish to drive it even further to the point of birth as a point of right. Um, I just think that that's wrong. You know, we, we need, uh, Sir Charles, um, most certainly we need to have a debate on why there is so much abortion in the United Kingdom. If I could go back to the point and answer my, my, my friend and colleague here, that why are second and third time pregnancies, why is that leading to abortion? Older woman leading to abortion. Why? Those questions need to be made. We need to have those. It can't all be, it can't all be ectopic. It can't all be rape. It can't all be incest. It can't all be miscarriage. There's issues here. There's issues, not, I'll, I'll give way. Yes, I'll give way back to your colleague first and then to... I thank him for giving way again. And he's very generous with his time. Um, but a woman is... And he's right. Nobody should be silenced. And that's what I wanted to achieve from this debate. And, and everybody has got... A, a choice, but it is ultimately the woman's body, and it's ultimately the, the the choice. And we mustn't conflate that because that is really important to women and girls everywhere, and not all have the privilege that we do to be able to have the comfort of bringing up a child. I, I, look, I, I understand the, the point that the member is making, but of course, it's two DNAs, two bloodstreams, two lives, uh, two heartbeats. It, it, it is more than just the woman's body. And whilst I accept that the woman has a very difficult choice to make and is sometimes put in that horrible position by irresponsible and selfish men, that the choice to protect a life uh, is something which sometimes women are talked out of. And I've seen that and I've heard that. And I want to make sure that that choice of allowing the life to flourish and to grow, and that there are other opportunities beyond the womb, that that is something which we should, of course, be dwelling on. I will give way to the member from Walthamstone. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He and I have debated this issue in many different ways, and I'm, I know he's not meaning to sound like he's suggesting that it's OK if a man tells a woman she has to have the baby, That's but right. not OK if he supports her choice to have an abortion, because that would be the corollary of what he's saying... But does he recognise that when it comes to legalisation in Northern Ireland, we didn't just have decriminalisation, we didn't just take away the Offences Against the Persons Act, we also brought in laws to regulate how a woman could access an abortion. There is no late-term abortion. There is no sex selection in Northern Ireland. The abortion Northern Ireland regulations 2020 that our colleague opposite wants to cover precisely those issues. So... It's not that enshrining a human rights perspective leads to no regulation. It removes the criminal element of our old regulation and allows us to have these very debates. Uh, uh, thank you, Sir Charles. Well, of course, the issue is that the member cannot say there is no late termination because she does not know. The member cannot say that there is no sex selection because she cannot know. The law now masks that and does not allow you to know that thing because it is a right to have it as of a right not because there is a reason, and that is, that is the, the issue, um, indeed, and, and I know it's an issue which the member would like to have here, I know the member would like to have termination right up to the point of birth, for, 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 for whatever reason, um, and, and it is an issue, 
and, and it is, is an issue. Well, maybe, maybe the member doesn't want to write up the point, of it, but she certainly wants the most liberal interpretation of the law that is possible. And uh, we, we will disagree on that, and, and, and that is the, the, is the case. But the attempt to silence people for having the conversation on this matter is, of course, morally wrong. And uh, I hope that uh, we, we, we'd never get to that position. I said I did want to touch Sir Charles on the issue of decriminalisation, because that has been an important point of this. And, and there are difficult cases. Of course, it is such a small number. The member um, touched upon 17 cases in, I think, eight, seven or eight years in the United Kingdom. And yes, it's difficult for those 17 people who have been questioned on this matter. Um, more difficult for the two people who have been charged. But let's deal with one of the cases where there was a charge brought, and that was, of course, the case of Sarah Gatt in 2010. And uh, in that, the examples of women who have been prosecuted following long-term abortions, which include Sarah Gatt in 2010, took abortion pills at a 39-week gestation and then buried the body of, uh, the, um, uh, of, of, of the child. The judge in the case said, and I quote him, all right-thinking people would consider this more serious than involuntary manslaughter or indeed any offence, say, of murder, end of quote. And there was no re uh, remorse detected, said the judge. But how would that case be dealt with in a new dispensation where there is no criminalisation? Would we be creating a gap that would allow, a gap in the law that would allow for people to, fright, quite frankly, get away with murder? Because that is the unfortunate circumstance. We also have circumstances where men wrongly try to enforce or encourage an abortion on a partner uh, who is pregnant by hiding tablets, putting those tablets into their drink, spiking their drink, trying to encourage them to have a miscarriage, forcing that. This decriminalisation, how would a, a, a clever lawyer get those people off that particular charge? And it would happen. So I think we enter into this new dispensation of this right space to put this on, on, into the Bill of Rights in the United Kingdom, which would be abhorrent in terms of the law. Because there are people who unfortunately do commit criminal offences, do commit it around pregnant women, are pregnant and do commit it, and the law should try to deal with it. And yes, deal with it sensitively, but deal with it proportionately. And I think 17 cases in seven years is proportionate, given that we have about uh, 900,000 pregnancies in the United Kingdom annually. Thank you, Sir Charles. Thank you very much. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Mr. Charles. It's a pleasure it is to be serving under your chairmanship.